miss California? Yeah. I mean, I only lived there a year. My wife grew up there. Um, we do not, I mean, we don't miss the traffic. We go back. Like, why do people endure this? Yeah. <laughs> it's miserable. Yeah. I no, we love it. Um, Amy's parents uh, live kind of near Long Beach, and, and so we we stay with them. Although, this is kind of weird. Uh, we all, so we have, there's six people in, in my family, my wife and four kids and I. We all sleep in her bedroom that she grew up in as a kid. So it's a queen size bed in the middle, two stacked cots on either side. I mean, it's a lot of that's six people in one little bedroom, and and half of them are teenagers. Wow, <laughs> it's not nobody loves that it. That is awkward. Nobody loves it. I know. <laughs> yes, yeah. See, that's weird. So, but but that's just what that's the price we pay. And then we you wake up and we wake up and go do whatever, enjoy go to the beach or whatever. The beach, yeah. yeah. So yeah, <laughs> yeah nobody, nobody likes that. Um. Okay, we're back with the tenth and final episode with Bill Bokestein, uh here on the All of Life for God podcast. Thank you guys. Those that have stuck with us, really grateful for that. And we hope that all of the sessions have been really beneficial. Even Jonathan Cruz's. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> you guys just know each other pretty I knew well. I get you with that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, no, his were great. Actually, we haven't even filmed those yet. They will be. They will be great. Yeah. Um, and the reason that we're talking to Bill and we talked to Jonathan and Andrew, in case you're just joining us, is because of their new book, Glorifying and Enjoying God. That's correct. I got it right? You got it right. Gosh. Yeah. Well what a title, man. It's yeah, great. Glorifying and Enjoying God. Yeah. But isn't, I get it wrong because the catechism says glorifying right. God and enjoying him forever. Correct. See, that's why. Yeah. So this had been a mouthful. I mean, that's, that's too much for a book. That would have been too much. Yeah. 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 That's why I said glorifying God would have been a good one, but too late for that. Yeah. Anyway, thank you guys for tuning in, um, here on the all of life for God podcast. If you haven't seen it, please go over to our other podcast, the modern Puritan, where we have a group podcast interview with Bill and Jonathan Cruz and Andrew Miller all together at one time, crammed in this little studio. Um, and that one was really fun. I remember we talked a lot about catechisms and yeah. the yeah, history kind of, the of catechism. Idea. That's right. Why are we doing the What catechism? is a catechism? Why do we do it? Yeah. Why was it important for you three, who are all ministers or pastors to, um, to engage in this project. We talked about the difference, some of the differences between the Heidelberg catechism, Westminster shorter. Um, we didn't really talk about the, about Luther's no. catechism. But just it is, briefly. we do reference it here and there yeah. in the book. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, but today what we're talking about is the 10th and final topic, which is eternal life and judgment. So, and as we've done in, uh, throughout this whole series, we're talking about what is it, like what is Westminster Shorter Catechism saying about it? Mm. What is the topic in general? And then uh, the follow-on question, of course, is, well, why does it matter? Yeah. So what does Westminster say about eternal life and judgment? And, and as I've said with, asked in the other times is, does it take up a significant portion of the catechism? Well, it's, it's actually, so I mentioned in a previous podcast that the outline of the catechism is two parts. First, what do I need to believe about God and what is my duty to God? Mm. This question about eternal life and judgment is the, is the conclusion of that first part. So it's, the, it's, it's fittingly the end of what I need to believe about God. And so um, the, the, the question is broken up into two parts. First of all, what benefits do believers receive from Christ at death? And then second, what benefit do believers receive from Christ at his resurrection? And so, you know, it's not, they're not, they're not any longer answers than the rest of it. But uh-huh. what, what we're closing out in this first section is the benefits that Christ has secured for us. And yeah. so we talk about uh, justification and sanctification um, now glorification. So what does it mean? The, the, the conclusion of the salvation that Christ has won for us and which the spirit has applied to us. Why do you think they framed it in terms of benefits? 
Well, that's a great question. I, I don't, I don't know the technical answer to that question, but I think that, you know, is, is Christ's death and resurrection advantageous to us? Mm -hmm. I mean, is there an advantage to it? Mm -hmm. And because I think the world would say, well, you know, take or leave Jesus, take him or leave him. Right. It's not, not so big of a deal, but, but, and I, and so what the, the catechism does is it puts it on the positive, right? Of course, there is a reference, uh, you know, if you're without Christ, you lack all these benefits, but with Christ, this is, this is what, this is God's promise to mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. And so rather than, you know, the, then a truncated gospel that we sometimes hear today, which is, you know, believe in Jesus and you'll have eternal life, which, which is of course true. The catechism says, let's flesh that out. What is mm-hmm. eternal life? What is salvation? What is it, you know, is it, is it just the avoidance of hell, which I think in some ways is how it's f- framed in contemporary terms? No, it's much more than that. It's the whole package of everything that God wants for his people. It's a restoration of what was lost in paradise when Adam and Eve sinned, and then some. You mm-hmm. know, it's, it's putting us not back into that position, but into an improved position in glorification. So benefits, um, I mean, we think in terms of benefits, you know, in sort of earthly terms, what are the advantages of this or that? So I think it's, yeah, of uh, what do you gain from Christ? And, mm-hmm. and, and it's important because Jesus' call to follow him is actually to lose your life, right? You, you, he, the call of the gospel, the call of discipleship is to lose your life for my sake, and then you'll find it. So if, if God is calling us to lose our life, to say no to all of the things that the world and the flesh and the devil entice us to, what is the, what do we gain, right? What is the benefit? Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, well, you, you gain your life that way. So what does that look like? Yeah. And and so the catechism examines what that looks like. So these questions end part one Mm -hmm. of two parts of the catechism. What's interesting to me is that, Um, and we talked about this in session one and session four that we had with you, Bill, is that the catechism, the Westminster Shorter Catechism opens with um, definitions. Okay. So, and what I mean by that is the question that starts it all off is um, what is the chief end of man? It's, It's a what question. And then what is God? Okay. And, and so forth. And then at the end here, it's, so it goes from definitions. So purpose of man, nature of God, but here at the end of part one, it's descriptions Mm. of benefits, describing the things, not, I think there's a distinction between a a definition and a description Mm. in the sense that um, the things that are initially dis, um, defined, then I'm, and I'm assuming here because I don't know the catechism well, but there's a point where this particular word that you used just a minute ago of promise comes into the picture. And then it's, so if we connect the things that are defined, humankind and God, especially the Trinitarian God, then there's a point, and you can tell me where that might be, where there's the description of the promise in so many term, so many ways that then results in the benefits, mm-hmm. right? So these are all connected. Am I getting that somewhat right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. you are. And the reason that, that these benefits are so important, the reason that they ask about them in, in connection with the promise is that some of the other things that God has promised to us, we have begun to experience, okay. right? Right. Yeah. Justification. That's we've experienced that, right? Um, when you know, when when the Spirit moves in us and we embrace Christ uh, and the promise of the gospel, um, that faith is counted as righteousness, and and we're justified forever in the sight of God, counted righteous as righteous as Jesus, as righteous mm-hmm. as if we had done all the things that Jesus has done himself. That's mm-hmm. how the Heidelberg puts it. Mm-hmm. Um, we've, we've experienced, you know, the, the, uh, 
the calling of the Spirit. We've ex- we're beginning to experience something of sanctification, being remade in the image of of Christ. So we're learning to say no to sin and say yes to righteousness. Mm-hmm. There's a transformation that's happening in us. We've received the Spirit. We've received the Spirit. That's exactly right. We've received the Spirit. There's some things that we haven't... So parts of that promise have not... Um, we haven't experienced yet, mm-hmm. right? And so that's where Paul brings in the element of hope. And he says, yes. hope is something that you do not yet, the, the thing that you're hoping for, you do not yet possess. Mm-hmm. If you possess it, it's not hope anymore. Mm-hmm. It's realization. Mm-hmm. And so we have to know what it is that that we're hoping for that God has promised we'll experience, but we haven't experienced yet. And death is that is that really hard line right between what we have experienced and what we haven't experienced personally mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. so i mean so there's a there's a, a theological question here right w- what part of the package of salvation do believers receive from Christ at death but there's also just a very experiential personal question what happens when i die yeah. Right? And I think that's yeah. a question that, again, like the first question, it's not just Christians who are asking that question. Now, the Catechism really only answers it for believers, recognizing that the the, uh, the converse is true for unbelievers, re- regrettably. But um, I so I need to know what... I've never died, right? I mean, there's... And, and people that I know who have died haven't come back and told me mm-hmm. what it's like. Mm-hmm. So I want to know what happens when I die. Why is it? Why is that so important, though? You talk about this final line of death. Why are the benefits so intrinsically tied to this thing that we all must experience? What is the Christian parent's greatest responsibility? to teach their children to trust the one true living God. Enrich your family devotions from the Family Worship Bible Guide. This precious book offers rich devotional thoughts for children of all ages on every chapter in the Bible. To learn more about the Family Worship Bible Guide, visit heritagebooks.org. Yeah, well, so because because death is at the at the one on the one hand, it is the personal experience of of our connectedness to Adam and the curse that God gave to Adam or promised before Adam even sinned. The day you eat this fruit, you'll die. So we promised death. So we do have to experience that, mm-hmm. not as a not as not as a curse in mm-hmm. its sense. In, in, in a technical sense, but as a result of the curse. So yeah, we yeah. have to experience that. Um, but so I, I but I want to know what that means for me, right? Does does dying mean that God hates me? You know, that right. is it, you know, can I can I die happily? You mm. know, knowing what's right around the you know, like when you were brought to do a scary thing, can you do that happily? Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I've never. You were in the military. Yeah. Uh, I've never been in the military, but I suppose if you, if you're called to go into a scary place, a combat situation, can you do that happily? I mean, it's kind of, mm-hmm. there's, it's intimidating, right? Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. death is intimidating to us. Um, how, yeah. How how do I feel about it? Yeah. Right. How, yeah. You know what's what what does this mean for me? I'm I'm focusing on death because we are talking about eternal life and judgment, and which are things that you as a human only experience after death. Of course, the disclaimer, there are some who will mm-hmm. still be alive when Christ returns, but for the majority of humanity, mm-hmm. um, the it's just interesting to me, and I've never thought about it like this until now, but um, there there's so many things in life that are challenging that we, that we look at those things and we think that's really hard, but it's going to be beneficial. And at, at the end of it or on the other side of it, I'm going to derive benefits. Mm-hmm. 
whether it's <clears throat> the crazy people who go do cold plunges or the guys who go to Navy SEAL mm-hmm. buds training or people who want to do like ultra marathons or even on the lesser scale, right? Just going through something difficult. Mm-hmm. I think even going through trauma that isn't, you know, self prescribed, it just happens to you or to your loved ones. But on the other end of that, there's this expectation that, well, I think for a lot of us, we like to be optimistic and think, well, I'm going to be a better person at the end of that yeah. once I get through that experience. With death, though, it's different, it seems, for the majority of people. It's almost as though, well, there's a, I guess there's a few different ways people come at it. It's, I don't think about it ever, or I think about it on occasion, but I'm trying to be really healthy, nutritious in the mm-hmm. meantime, and just that's in the future. Or there's those who perhaps maybe obsess over it. And sadly, there's those who try to speed things up, Yeah, and, you know, through suicide or whatever. Well, yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you were, uh, Bill Bryson's book, The Body, he is really a wonderful, informative book I found. Uh, but he says, modern medicine largely is our attempt to not die, mm-hmm. you know, to, to postpone death as long as possible. We do things that truly are not even probably remotely helpful, yeah. but we think they might be in anything we can grab <laughs> onto, you know, this combination of antioxidants and vitamins and this, because yeah. we just don't want to die. Yeah, and, we don't want to die. Yeah. So that's why coming back around to the, uh, the catechism is um, talking about death in terms of benefits is very interesting because it's as though passing through that gate is, well, how would Westminster talk about it? As a, as something that we're fated to do or as like the the ultimate accomplishment? Well, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's a mixture, isn't it? Because it is, the reason people die is because of sin, mm-hmm. right? I mean, so it's not a, it's not a natural thing. You know, it's not like our bodies were created to give out after a certain, you know, like that God's design was different than that. And so there is a, there's a penalty aspect that we're bearing the corporate, the result of the corporate penalty, but it's not a, it's not a judgment, a personal judgment against the individual dying, right? It's like, I'm part of this family and this is what's happened. You know, this, this is what, what's going to happen to us. Huh. But so, so it's both. I mean, so it, that's, I think, partly why it's, it's scary, not just because it's unknown, but because it's not connected to a good, it's not, you know, it's not like, you know, the end of the ride and you get off the ride and you're done. And it's, <laughs> it's something negative, right? You know, and that's why the Bible talks about yeah. humanity being held sort of hostage to the fear of death because it's unknown and because it's unnatural mm. and it's connected to, the holiness of God and the wrath of God against sin. Mm -hmm. And yet, and that's, and I think that's why it's so important that the catechism says, what benefits does the believer receive at death? You know, so it's framing it in, this is, this is the conclusion of your, uh, of your earthly (sighs) journey. And it's, it's a turning point in which you're going to finally experience all that God has promised. Mm. And so you can't, and, and you, like you said, typically you don't get all that God has promised apart from that. So you do have to go through this. I mean, it's like, you know, in, in, in Bunyan's classic Pilgrim's Progress, it's that, it's that river that separates the pilgrims from the celestial city to which they've been journeying the whole time. I mean, that's what they've been going for. And so to get there, though, you have to go through death. Mm-hmm. And so it's scary but of course you, 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 you want to get there, you know? Yeah. So, and yeah. that's why there's this mixture, isn't there? Even in, in, uh, in like the apostle Paul wrestling with, you know, is it, I'd love, I'd love to be absent from this body, to be present with the Lord, to be done with sin, to be done with all this frustration. Mm-hmm. I want to see Jesus like we talked about in a previous session, but it's, it's a hard thing. Yeah. And it, death oftentimes is painful and Yep. Yep. And associated with 
destruction of something beautiful. Yeah, like yeah, it's a, it's called a tent that's being destroyed. Yeah, in in Second uh, Corinthians five. Yeah, although I have talked to uh, believers and uh, even had the thought myself sometimes of, wouldn't it be nice to be dead? Meaning in the sense of <laughs> at rest, mm-hmm. like permanently at rest, like Paul talked in, in the, in the Pauline yeah, sense, yeah. not in like the, you know, I hate my life. Yeah. yeah. I, no, I know. I talk <clears throat> about it a lot actually. So I totally sympathize with you. In fact, my kids say, dad, you, you talk about dying too often. Really? <laughs> I do. You know, I say, look, I mean, I'm 40, 40, Come on. 45, yeah. 44, I don't remember, 44, 45. Yeah. So you're, I'm, half, I'm you're halfway, halfway done. There. Halfway right. There. That was my point. Halfway done. I'm not old enough to not remember my age. So halfway done. And, uh, and, and so I'm okay with that. You know, mm. it's, it's, uh, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to go back to 17 and start over. No. Not knowing that no. you now you gotta go that much further again. Yeah. And you know, if, so yeah, I think it's, I think it's good. To, I mean, the old Testament saints, they talked about dying. You know, Joseph gathers his, his sons, Jacob gathers his sons, um, gives instructions, gives blessings, in, embraced it. You know, I think that's really important. So yeah. I think we should talk about it. We should think about it. Yeah. Um, it is, it is inevitable, yeah. you know, unless, you know, unless Christ comes first. Yeah. We've, I've been talking to my kids a lot about death recently because we had a, had a chipmunk infestation and sadly I've had to use lethal traps on them. I didn't think we were going to talk about this in the recording. <laughs> <laughs> it's relevant. Okay. Bad <laughs> lightly. Be careful. But um um so my it's been a good teaching I I'm in all seriousness, it's been a good teaching lesson for them because chipmunks are honestly quite adorable creatures, mm-hmm. but they do very very destructive things. And <clears throat> especially in and around foundations of homes and whatnot. And when you get an infestation, we're talking about at least a dozen or more. Yeah. And not not pleasant. It's not pleasant anymore. You know, they're not so cute. And so for the girls, it's like the girls in particular, but also for my son, who's the eldest, um, I've had to through very like visual means be like, well, you've seen the live chipmunks. Mm -hmm. Now here's a dead one, you know, but I have to confess, like looking at one of these animals, dead there is a sense of like repose hmm. the animal and I, I look at that creature and I think I'm so sorry that I had to terminate your life but you don't have to suffer through another Michigan winter seriously they're rough here there's no more daily like they don't have they can't go to a store they mm-hmm. can't just buy food like yeah. every day is survival for them mm-hmm. and you look at like the animal just laying there now and you're like, like it's at peace. Mm. And I, I have no idea where the animal goes afterwards. You know, um, I would hope like in Romans eight, maybe they're part of the new creation. I I don't know. Surely, I think, yes, yes. Maybe. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not in the sense of, you know, individual, you know, like, this particular chipmunks going. You don't think Ted and Johnny and the girls. I mean, surely there are animals in the new creation. But I don't think it's right for us to think, you know, like that they have meet souls with, or anything. Yeah. That's going to no, I mean, be... because you know, at least in the in Ecclesiastes it talks about the soul of a person when they die, go to back to the Lord. Yeah, soul of an animal, go back to the ground. But, yeah, but yeah. yeah. Anyway, I bring that analogy. There's that image up. of rest, though. That, that it's that, that image rest of rest. Yeah. yeah, and sometimes that's that's been even helpful for me as an adult is thinking because sometimes I do think about um, like my dad. You know, he's getting older and. Um, I just think about when I get to the age where I start losing certain just capacities as a human, you know, just either mentally or physically or whatever. Um, I, I kind of cringe at that. Like, Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't want to get old. I don't want to get old. And yet there's the positive sense of, well, actually I'm every day getting closer to that threshold. And let's say I make it into my eighties or Mm nineties. I'm then even more close to, that threshold of, well, crossing the river and, and being at peace, you know, and not only at peace in the sense of where some secular 
thinkers might talk about, well, you know, I just think we just stop existing, mm-hmm. you know, and life is over. Yeah. But in this, in a Christian biblical sense of like, yeah. well, now I'm in the presence of my father. Right. No, and you're right. And, and so I think that I was a little nervous about where your chipmunk illustration was going to lead us, but I think you're exactly right in the sense that um, life is hard. Not, not just for the chipmunk, but for people. I mean, it's, you know, Jesus says in this, in this world, you will have many troubles, mm-hmm. problems. I mean, it's, it's hard to, it's, it's hard to get up sometimes in the morning. It's hard to, so that we are, we're wasting away. I mean, literally yeah. we're all in the yeah. process of dying, which is a, a very strange. Every day. Every day. Yeah. yeah. And, and so it's, it's, a, it is hard to be alive in a fallen world. Yeah. You know, it's a, and so. We are, we're actually, we're actually aching, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, not to be unclothed, right? Not, not to die. That's not really the thing, but to be reclothed. And to get there, we have to go through death. So we're, we're not really, we're not really yearning to die. We're yearning for what death yields mm. for the believer, which mm-hmm. is why I think the idea of benefit is so helpful, as, yeah. as the catechism puts it. Yeah. What are the benefits? Um, what what a, so you know? It's, it's you talked earlier about some of the hard things that we endure on purpose or or not on purpose, and the benefits that can come from them. Uh, Hebrews twelve, the writers talks about discipline not being pleasant at the time but mm-hmm. painful, but mm-hmm. afterwards it yields a peaceable fruit of yeah. righteousness yeah. for those who've been trained by it. And so I think we've got there's a, death is a little bit of I think it's part of that that disciplining, you know, and and but there's fruit on mm-hmm. the other side of it. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's you know when 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 you're dying or you're walking alongside of another believer who's dying, it's helpful to have this catalog that the, that the uh, catechism provides to say, look, I mean, it almost puts it in the form of a checklist. Like here are, here's this catalog of benefits. This is what you're, you know, because I think most Christians wouldn't, you know, we, we use, we use uh, phrases like going to a better place or, you know, they're no longer hurting anymore, which is all true. But that's about the extent of what we usually know to say. Hmm. But I think the catechism mentions like seven benefits. What are some of those? Yeah, so thank you for asking. <laughs> um, so the, the, the first one, it says, the, the souls of believers are at their death made perfect in holiness. And an unbeliever doesn't, doesn't so much care about holiness or yeah. the struggle to achieve, you know, to experience holiness. But a Christian does, and a Christian finds it very frustrating to not to not be holy, right? I mean, if we're serious about walking with the Lord, we're we're irritated by our failures. Mm-hmm. Well, at death, we're instantly made perfect. Mm-hmm. I, no longer plagued by temptations, irritated by past sin, guilt, shame, doubt about whether we're going to persevere. I mean, you ever have a as a Christian even think, man, what if I got to live forty more years? Can I persevere for forty more years? Wow! Yeah. You know? yeah. But you don't even have to think about that anymore. So that's so number one. Uh, at their death, made perfect in holiness, and do immediately pass into glory. So there's a there's a there's a an entering into the presence of God. That's that's a benefit. Um, their bodies. This is interesting. Their bodies being still united to Christ do rest in their graves till the resurrection. And when I first read that, I thought, how is that a benefit? What, you know, why, why would I care? But I, I, for a few reasons. One, we believe in the resurrection, which is coming up in a moment. So we believe that our bodies matter. But I just love the idea of Christ continuing to care for my body mm. even after I've died. Hmm. Right? I mean, yeah. yeah. You know, whether it's in a, in a, in a particular tomb or, you know, a elements scattered across the globe, the Lord cares for those elements. Yeah. Even after I've died, if remember, I don't need them anymore at that mm. moment. The Lord still cares about them. Mm. So I think that element of being kept safe in the grave um, and, and then resting the, you know, we don't, we don't believe that the soul is sleeping or resting, but our bodies are resting, you know, in, in a sense, that's a body. It's gone through perhaps a traumatic death or at least a life that was hard, mm-hmm. resting in Christ. Yeah. And so that, that symbol of, um, you know, that euphemism that the scripture uses, falling asleep in Christ, mm-hmm. 
well, it's it's not only it's not it's not really just a, a way of softening the harder way of saying he died. It's a way of truly describing that even in death, your body's resting with the Lord. Yeah. So yeah. so those are the benefits that believers receive actually at death. And then there in um, in terms of how we theologically understand that. The, the connection between our death and the resurrection, we speak of an intermediate state. So there's a completion of one phase of our life when we die, but Christ has not yet returned to finalize mm-hmm. salvation. There's a, there is a period of waiting. Now, it's hard to know exactly what that looks like, but s- souls, safe, secure, holy, with Jesus not in jeopardy, not undergoing further purifying or tribulation or punishment or anything like that, as the medieval church taught, Um, truly with Jesus, but we're, we're, we're waiting for the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think even in in the, in the book of Revelation, you have the souls saying, how long? Right. Right. So there's this, you know, how much longer till our, till Christ comes and judges and, So there's that anticipation. So that's yeah. the first part, and then it's and then it's the second question is what do the benefits what are the benefits that we receive at the resurrection? Yeah. So it's sort of two phases. Yeah. Yeah, that waiting period that's yeah. going to be interesting. I know. Like and and then like it, it's a, like it's a blessed waiting. A blessed right? waiting because we're with him. Yep. Yep. A good waiting. It's it's. Uh, I don't know. I mean, some waiting is hard, but if you're waiting for something that you know is good mm. and you're in a good place, mm-hmm. it's comfortable, that's a good wait. Yeah. So, but I think even this is important. Just, it, it corrects some of our uh, theological wishes or, you know, I don't know how to put it exactly, but, you know, I'll, every time I go to a funeral, somebody will say, isn't it wonderful to know that the deceased is now holding hands with Jesus or dancing with, like, well, you do believe in the resurrection, right? So, Holding with what hand? I mean, there's no like they, they haven't been <laughs> resurrected yet. So, so I just think there's this. We we sort of sentimentalize um, this intermediate state, absent from the testimony of Scripture. Mm-hmm. And so, no, they're not. They're not. They're not holding hands. They're not. You know, they're they're yearning. There's a but yeah. it's a good kind of yearning. They're yeah. waiting. And I think that's important, Tavis, because we undervalue the resurrection of the body. We don't even think about it. Someone dies. And they're and we're like, well, they've they've made it. That's it. They're they're now they're now fully saved. No, they're not fully saved. I mean, in the sense that they're waiting for to be reclothed mm-hmm. with an actual body. Mm-hmm. And so that resurrection is I'm so glad that the catechism divides the benefits that believers receive at death from the belie- the benefits that believers receive at the resurrection of Christ. Because yeah. there's an unfinishedness. To yeah, I don't salvation. I don't hear much of that being spoken mm-hmm. about. No, I don't either. No. Yeah. yeah, there's this focus on it's kind of like you die and there you go. That's it. You're, you're, yeah, like you said, you're in the better place yeah. now. Yeah, I mean, hopefully, I mean, I don't, you don't know who the person's talking about, but hopefully they're right. But even that better place is, in a sense, incomplete for them. Yeah, you're still or awaiting further benefit. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Why do you think the... Um, why do you think the Westminster Shorter Catechism concludes part one with this discussion of eternal life and judgment? Well, I, I think it's because you have to know the extent of what God has promised before you're set out on the journey of obedience. Yeah. Right? Like, okay, I and got so it. And so benefits proceed immediately. Yeah, absolutely. Immediately That's what grace proceed. does, right? We're not, it, I mean, can you imagine if this was flipped around mm. and the catechism said, what do we need to do to please God. Mm-hmm. And that's the first half of the catechism. <laughs> and then the second <laughs> then the second part is, oh, and by the way, what is, you know, what what is God all about? What has he yeah. done for us and whatnot? No, it's, yeah. of course it's it's the other way. And so it's it's grace. It's it's trying to give us a, a full understanding of grace so that it's it's I mean it's like it's like the epistle to the Romans, you know, where you've got salvation explained, worked out, and then you've got Romans 12 now we have this opportunity to give our lives in service to the Lord as as living sacrifices, as mm. as um, 
thankful to God for everything that he's done, for all that he's promised that we haven't even tasted yet, but we know is coming. Well, then I can live to, I can live for God for that. Yeah. You know, like I want, yeah. I want to live for God now yeah. because of that. So, yeah. you know, it's a great way to end that first section and then say, I mean, we didn't, we didn't talk about all the benefits of the re- resurrection, but the next question is, what is the duty which God requireth of me? And you, you, you almost think after, if you really understood the first part, you could almost answer that question with, does it matter? Right. Like whatever. Like yeah. whatever the duty is. Yeah. Because you know, look at the benefits. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. <laughs> <laughs> like look at who he is. Look at who I am. Mm-hmm. And look at what the benefits are of being his. Yeah. I'll do whatever. I'll do it. Do yeah. whatever. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, you got it. You got to get that, that, um, the, the, in, the indicative of salvation first. This, the what is. This is what it is. This is mm-hmm. what God is going to do. God will do it. And, and then the imperative comes. Then the imperative. This is how you must live. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The section on the Lord's Prayer is that in the indicative or the imperative? Would you like to deepen your understanding of Reformed theology? Check out Reformed Systematic Theology, Volume 4, Church and Last Things, by Dr. Joel Beakey and Paul Smalley, to explore key scripture topics from biblical, doctrinal, experiential, and practical perspectives. Pre-order the culmination of Dr. Beakey's life's work at Heritage Books dot o-r-g forward slash r-s-t-4 I mean it's in the second section so it's in the what does God require uh-huh. of man but it's you know that's interesting so it is but it's it's us it's us um Having to pray, like we have to pray. It is a responsibility to pray, right? This is how you shall pray, Jesus says. This is how you should pray. Um, but even that, it's like, how bad, like, is it a bad chore? I mean, how bad is, like, is it, you know, you're communicating with God. You know, so yeah. it's not, so it is in yeah. the, it's in the duty section, but it's not like a bad chore. No, and I, I ask that because, of course, the, the Lord's Prayer does include this eschatological language, mm. thy kingdom come. Yeah. Yeah. In the beginning and the end, if we're doing the longer, mm-hmm. Westminster does the longer version, mm-hmm. like, okay. Yep. So, um, yeah, that's why I asked that question. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, so part of our duty is to pray that God would, you know, that that the coming of his kingdom would be realized among us, you know, mm-hmm. so... So pray that the kingdom of Satan would be frustrated, right? That's mm. part of our responsibility right now. Right, that Satan would have uh, less, you know, less access to God's people. That yeah. his schemes would fail. Yeah. Um, that he would experience the shame that, <laughs> that he deserves, and, and all that. So, yeah, it's, you're right. It's eschatological, but it's 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 brought into our responsibilities mm. here and now. We mm-hmm. know. I mean, we've already seen the picture. Of of Satan being cast into the bottomless pit, in, right in Revelation. So we 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 know what's happening, but we should we need to still pray for that, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You've just expanded my understanding of the Lord's Prayer just now. I mean, what's well, a great it, it's a great tool. Well, I mean, in the in the very specific sense of the of this this Thy Kingdom come links back to what benefits mm-hmm. those questions at the end of the first part. Yeah. Right. So I, you, you know, when we, I was reading a theologian the other day who talks about praying the Lord's prayer, but if there's a moment in the prayer where you, you, you have cause to just stop and ponder, do it, just stop and mm-hmm. ponder that aspect of the Lord's prayer, but in an informed biblical way. Right. So the fact that I can go and pray the Lord's prayer later today and, at the parts talking about the kingdom think yes, so that I might receive those benefits that you have promised. Yeah. Yeah. Sanctification. Yeah. You know, that's part of like complete, Lord, sanctifica- help me the complete to sanctification. Live. Yeah. yeah. Well, yes. And along the way, 
help me to live like a citizen of your kingdom. Mm, like mm, help me to begin even to now. even now. Mm, yeah. 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 Does the Westminster Shorter talk about the about unbelievers in terms of judgment and eternal damnation? Um so I I mean the emphasis here is on on the benefits that believers receive. Okay. And the reason for that is this is this is a it's a it's a it's a catechetical, you know, it's instruction for particularly children in the home mm. of covenant people. And yeah. so it's not a it's not a it's not expressing a a, a presumption, mm-hmm. you know, a careless presumption that we're we're talking to believers, but there is an expectation that as the father and the mother are catechizing their children, um, the expectation is that that you you should believe and we're we're urging you to believe and here's a reason to believe this is the benefit that believers have so surely the the warning is tied in here that if if you if you don't if you don't believe then you don't have access to these benefits yeah. but i love how the emphasis is on the positive yes it's like kids you know <laughs> this is what you this is what you have to believe about god and and here's why here are the benefits that you'll receive yeah. Yeah, because so often, um, as you know, there's such an emphasis on, or there has been, even stereotypically, you know, you think of the evangelistic approach that says, you know, believe in Jesus or you're going to go to hell. Mm -hmm. But you've said there's seven benefits that are outlined in the West. Yeah, that's what I see, yeah. Yeah. And so not to neglect the reality of hell, but to especially in a family worship setting to emphasize, Hey, this is what's, what awaits you. Yeah. And it's, and it's all, and it's not like it's God giving you this pile of stuff. Mm. It's, it's getting God. I mean, it's like, this Mm. is the reward is, Mm. is actually experiencing God. But I mean, what a poor, I love how you just put it. Um, what a poor evangelistic invitation, you know, uh, believe in Jesus and don't go to hell. (laughs) <laughs> period. I mean, like, like how bad is it actually to be like, why don't you say anything? Po- like, is there nothing good to be said about, you know, believing well, in the Lord? So to, I, to be fair, th- a lot of times they say, there. you know, have the, like you'll have true hope, you'll have joy. It's expressed in those terms mm-hmm. of like hope and joy and, um, well, filling the hole in your heart. I don't even know what that means, but you know, it's, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not as specific as some of the things that you've mentioned Mm -hmm. that, that the Westminster Shorter expresses. Can you, can you say some of those? Yeah, sure. So, so we've touched on the, um, the benefits that we receive at death at the resurrection that here's the answer at the resurrection believers being raised up in glory. So that's a very, very short way of describing our resurrection, being raised up in glory. So that's like, it's like footnoting to 1 Corinthians 15. Mm-hmm. So it's only a few words, but understand, you know, we're sown corruptible, raised incorruptible, yeah. all of that. So yeah. raised up in glory, which is, I mean, now that I think about it, it's a wonderful, um, going back to the first question and answer, that we're to glorify God, that 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 idea of glory deser- mm-hmm. that God deserves we'll we'll experience something of that ourselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so resurrection then shall be openly acknowledged and acquitted in the day of judgment. So here I love how I think most people would, um, even Christians would think about the day of judgment in kind of a negative way, or at least in an ominous way, you know, judgment. And the judgment sounds negative to almost everybody today. But this is actually all, it's set up as an acquittal. Like, you know, it's, it's not like there's suspense for the believer. Mm -hmm. You're, you're getting your day in court, so to speak, for the purpose of acquittal. Mm -hmm. You just, the day is coming when, Mm -hmm. and so God, and God is going to not, not of course, because you deserve to be acquitted, because actually the Bible says that all of our deeds that we've thought or said or done are going to be publicized. And so clearly we're damnable. I mean, by our own, by our own works, but Christ comes and presents himself as our atoning sacrifice and delivers us 
from the judgment that we deserve. And so that's Jesus openly acknowledging us, which is an incredible thought, isn't it? Um, I mean, if you've had you've had friends perhaps double cross you and mistreat you, and like you're like, I don't want to even acknowledge those guys anymore. But yeah. Jesus will acknowledge us publicly as his brothers and sisters, as his family. So that's sort of a public, it's like a, it's like a celebration. The judgment is desirable, which is why the saints in Revelation say, come quickly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? mm-hmm. We want to judge, <laughs> to vindicate, to acknowledge us. And made perfectly blessed in the full enjoying of God to all eternity. Hmm. So there's the tie-in to the first question and answer. That's right. Right? And we were talking about that in the first session. I can't fully enjoy God right now. Or anything. Or, right, or anything, right. Exactly. All the things that we think are going to satisfy, they don't. Even God, I can't, I can't experience God fully. I can't. Yeah. But then we'll be made perfectly blessed in the full enjoying of God hmm. to all eternity. Hmm. So what we're striving for now is going to be given to us at the resurrection of Christ. Mm-hmm. So, so that's, I yeah. mean, that's, this is a unbelievable um, transition to what is the duty that God requires yeah. of man. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there it is. There's, there's the, the glory and the joy. See, that would have been a great title. The glory and the joy. The glory and the joy. Okay. For the second printing. The, I like that. Cause that's how it opens. And that's how, at least part one closes, right? Yeah. Is, as you mentioned, as you just expressed it, our participation in God's glory, which is his, by his agency, Mm. then with the corollary or the result of us, it says full enjoyment Mm. of him forever. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. To all eternity. So how, how important is that word full there? I'm not asking you, I'm saying yeah, huge. You know, it's a rhetorical question. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, you're exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Partial is inadequate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we need the whole thing. And it doesn't say the diminishing or the temporary or anything, right. just the full full enjoyment of him forever. And I Yeah, and then if yeah. you embrace uh the idea that um as I did in a previous book that RHB published on the end times. Um, that there's there's progress in glory, mm-hmm. right? There's mm-hmm. advancement, there's there's development, and then you think, well, we actually can continue to experience the the newness of the beauty of God, mm-hmm. you know, which is mm-hmm. amazing because sometimes when you make some new discovery, you, you say, wow, wow, you know, and then that that newness sort of wears off after a while; it's no longer That's fresh. Right. That's right. But not in not in this. It's it's this this layering on of our understanding and our experience of God mm-hmm. um, in a way that not only doesn't get old, but increasingly becomes new. Yeah, and yeah, you've got that image in in the in Lewis's conclusion of his uh, uh, Chronicles of Narnia of this of this movement into ever closer to the center of mm-hmm. what mm-hmm. we've been working toward and walking toward yeah. and expecting. And yeah. So, yeah. Well, I look forward to fully enjoying God forever with you. Me too. And you too, Abby and yeah. you too, AJ. I know. And, and all of you watching yeah. too. I mean, what a concept Well, that yeah. is, well, it's incomprehensible really, but it's, it's a promise that's been made. Yeah. Because think about it, even the people you love the most, you don't love perfectly. They don't no. love you perfectly. You yeah. don't enjoy them as well. You know, I mean, all of these wonderful relationships um, stripped of that tarnish mm-hmm. uh, and, and the drag that sin is. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It's wonderful to think wow. about. Yeah. We hadn't even talked about that. We're, you know, we're just, we're thinking first <laughs> as we should about experiencing God, but now you bring in that whole other dimension. Uh-huh. Yeah. Cause this is, this is collective. It's believers. It's not, what do you receive? It's all of us. That's right. It's wonderful. Like the end of um, Romans 15, mm. we glorifying God with one voice, you know, Paul trying to bring Jew and Gentile believer together. Mm. But this fact that, which ties back, I think, to Romans 11 in a yeah. sense of this, 
it all ends in a doxology. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see people that we didn't know, places we've never been to, you know, <laughs> all kinds of wonderful, yeah. I'm assuming, stories to tell. And, yeah. 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 Thanks, Bill. Yeah, thank you. Wow. really appreciate this. What a good way to uh, end off this series. Thank you. Well, again, for those of you listening, we, we're really happy that you've stuck with us. And I think we ended on a really, really good note. Um, again, I can't encourage you enough. Get get a copy of this book. There's probably more thinking and pontificating and, and devotional thinking about this very sort of thing in um, the glory and the joy. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I had to ruin the title at the end. In uh, glorifying and enjoying God. Please get a copy of that from um, Reformation Heritage Books. But um, yeah, if you haven't seen the rest of this podcast series, this is number 10. Uh, so go back to number one and just get through all these. And I hope there's a lot that you all benefit from that. And also don't forget to check out the group podcast that we did with Bill and Jonathan and Andrew on the Modern Puritan. But um, yeah, Bill, let's get you back in here for another long discussion okay. soon. I'm really glad Looking that you, you came and, and also that you helped finish off this series. I mm-hmm. think it couldn't have gone any better. Thank you. Especially Dad. if we'd had Jonathan in. It just would have been <laughs> rough. Well, you, you guys are going to have some things to talk about, aren't you? <laughs> I'll pray for your friendship. Thank you. Yeah, we need it. (laughs) Thanks, Bill. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for listening to All of Life for God by Reformation Heritage Books. If you have enjoyed this episode and would like to hear more, please consider subscribing and sharing with a friend. Reformation Heritage Books is a nonprofit ministry aiming to strengthen the church through Reformed, Puritan, and experiential literature. To learn more about this ministry and how to support us, please visit rhb.org.